Good evening. On behalf of the Cuba program of the Institute of Latin American Studies at Columbia University, I want to welcome you all and particularly our panelists today, Hope Bastien from Wheaton College and Gabriel Vignoli from the New School University, who will be our speakers to update Cuba. We had a webinar in early August that was immensely popular in terms of discussing current developments in Cuba. And so we immediately thought of an update. And this is the update to the update in August. I also want to mention before I introduce our speakers and our technicus that on October 26, we will have an update on Peru. This webinar series is entitled Cuba and Beyond, and Peru fits into the beyond part. And we're very happy as a result of a number of requests to focus on current developments in Peru with a new president, with a great deal of discussion about the composition of the cabinet and increasing debate within the political elites, amongst the political elites in Peru. Our speakers on that day will be Joe Marie Burt from George Mason University, Cynthia McClintock from George Washington University, and Martha Pro Santana from Lima, Peru, where she is the director of the Center for Development, Rural and Urban. She is also a specialist on the socioeconomic status of women and children. Then on November 4th, we will have a launch of the book that the Environmental Defense Fund, the American College of Environmental Lawyers, and the Fundacion Antonio Nunez Jimenez in Havana, Cuba, have put together concerning whether or not there are good possibilities of a return of the US and Cuba to a dialogue concerning cooperation on environmental issues, which had been underway prior to 2017. So those two upcoming webinars, you should put on your calendar. I'm now going to introduce our technicus, Gretchen Sanchez, has been since 2019, the assistant to the Cuba program at Columbia. And she is transitioning out. And Ellen Johnson, who is here in the upper right corner, at least on my screen, uh, is taking over, et cetera. And she will be in charge of most of the technical issues. The most important of which is you should put your questions for both speakers, Hope and Gabrielle, in the Q&A slot, not in the chat room. We're not going to use the chat room tonight. So make sure you put the questions that you want our panelists to answer in the Q&A. And either Ellen or I will gather them together and direct them to the panelists. I am now going to start the actual former part of the evening's dialogue. Our first speaker, speaker will be doc, Dr. Hope Bastian, who is at Wheaton College, and she holds a PhD from American University in Anthropology. Her dissertation was published as Everyday Adjustments in Havana, Economic Reforms, Mobility and Emerging Inequalities in 2018, which examines the impacts of economic reforms in Cuba on everyday life and inequalities in that country. She has lived in Cuba up until very recently, 
August, I believe, uh, for 10 years. And she's going to share with us, obviously, the background to current socioeconomic conditions in Cuba, as well as other topics, including the status of women and children. And she will be followed by Dr. Gabriel Vignoli, who is a professor at New School University. He received both of his doctorates, one from the University of Calabria in Italy and the other from the New School University. He recently returned in August of this year from Cuba, where he spent three months running one of the most successful and one of the few exchange programs for students that has survived uh, the Trump administration. And so we have two people who have lived for many years in Cuba. Gabriel is Cuban Italian, and he goes to Cuba on a regular basis uh, to see his mother, as well as to do research. And uh, hope lived there pretty much for 10 years and now will be has traded sunny Cuba for the snows of Massachusetts, which hopefully won't begin until at least January. So let's begin with hope. OK, well, I imagine that many of you have been to Cuba, uh, perhaps many times over the years, um, and, but most certainly during this short period of normalization. And it was a time of great optimism on the island. There were a generation of educated young Cubans who made the decision to swim against the current. And rather than migrate, they stayed in Cuba. They were able to find work using their education, their skills, their creativity to earn income that allowed them to have a better life than their parents. They're the generation that stayed. Small businesses boomed, increasingly serving locals with access to CUC and the middle class grew, norms shifted. It was okay to have a small business. It was okay to travel without having to sever your ties to the island forever. Cubans abroad were invited to repatriate and join in the project of building a new prosperous socialism. However, at the same time, inequalities emerging since the special period continued to grow and the differences between the new middle class and those being left behind came into a sharper focus and they were impossible to ignore. Many uh, like of you, like me, had the opportunity to witness these changes in person. Um, and today I'm going to talk about what happened next. After the excitement of the Obama opening, I've been living in Cuba for about a decade. And during this time as an anthropologist, I've studied inequalities in Cuba and their impacts in everyday life in Havana. As a Cuban permanent resident, I've worked in the state sector, teaching at the university, and like many Cubans of my generation who chose to stay, in addition to my state sector job, I also had a second job that paid in hard currency. So my talk today is based on my experiences as a researcher and as a Havana resident until uh, this July, living in Plaza, working in Old Havana, and the relationships that I formed in my most recent research about birth and breastfeeding in, in the capital, which have connected me to women and with small children across the city. So I'm here to catch you up on what's been going on in Havana. Things have been changing very quickly in the last couple of years. Living in Cuba um, during the Obama administration, from Obama to Trump to Biden, has shown me many different ways in which Cuban sovereignty is, is constrained by US actions. Increasing pressures are often rooted in US policy that have made life more difficult, cutting off remittances, cutting off mobility. Um, with the end of the wet foot, dry foot policy, the exceptional treatment of Cubans who arrived to the U.S. without visas um, and the closing of the U.S. consulate in September 2017, uh, an important escape valve of pressure in Cuba was eliminated. Many commenters, as they try to explain what happened in Cuba in July, uh, on July 11th, have called it a perfect storm, and I agree. It wasn't just one thing. It's everything. The economy is tanking. The bread lines are unbearable. For the mothers I work with in my research, finding malanga, yogurt, oatmeal, the first solids offered to Cuban babies is an all-consuming task. 
The price of eggs and powdered milk on the black market have soared, and people are still thinking in CUCs, even though they don't exist anymore. Despite the perception outside of Cuba that nothing ever changes in the island, the problem that many Cubans complain about is actually the opposite. It's the instability. It's the constant unpredictable changes that wear people down. Last year in Havana, a parent in a WhatsApp group told me, everything's always changing. You don't know why. You don't know what's coming next. You don't know what you can do. And at the same time, you know you can't do anything except change the way you react. No coger lucha. Every day is an act of resistance. The everyday economic struggles, the fear of contagion, and a state discourse that's blaming the population irresponsibility for raising COVID rates after months of unprecedented sacrifice. In April 2018, Diaz Canal became the president of the Council of State and Ministers. And of course, he's not a Castro. He didn't fight in the Sierra, um, and he was not chosen through a direct election. So he has a lot to prove to earn the position that he's been given. He was a relative unknown, um, and he was being expected to both deliver on the promise of continuity, and others expected him to deliver on a promise of change. So it's an impossible expectation in any context. That summer, the constitutional um, consultation began in 2018, and the proposal included Article 68, which would open the door to same-sex marriage. Throughout the fall, evangelical churches organized opposition across the country and threatened to vote against the constitution unless it was removed. Emerging groups of LGBT activists and students, journalists working in state media and intellectuals on the island tried to organize support for the article, but they received pressure from the state not to speak out, asking them to avoid confrontation with the fundamentalist churches. Now, meanwhile, in the US, the National Security Advisor John Bolton is labeling Cuba part of the Troika of tyranny and announcing a new wave of sanctions to penalize Cuba, furthering travel restrictions. And when the National Assembly published the final draft of the Constitution in December, the same-sex marriage proposal had been eliminated. And statements on social media from the National Assembly seemed to point to this as proof of the democratic nature of the process that people's opinions were being taken into account. And the fundamentalist sects were emboldened. They cried victory and LGBT activists retreated to try to reassess their efforts and to contemplate the contradictions of a state that had proposed a really progressive reform, but then failed to defend it. And them, instead subjecting their rights to a popular referendum and by doing so, ceding political power to religious actors in a secular nation. The same month, internet access became available on cell phones, and the internet was no longer a place that one goes to, as, as we did when we had to go to the Wi-Fi parks. Um, and this virtual space became available anywhere your cell phone could take you. Uh, when a freak tornado hit Havana in January, the internet access was essential for organizing spontaneous civil society organizing that connected Cubans on and off the island to support the people in the affected area. They collected donations, they organized work brigades, and they delivered needed aid directly to affected households. In February, the constitutional referendum passed. 84% voter turnout, 87% approval. And in March, the US stopped issuing five-year tourist visas to Cubans. Since about 2008, Cinesex has hosted an annual event around May 17th, the International Day Against Homophobia and Transphobia. And for the, more than a decade, LGBT Cubans and allies have marched. It usually happens on a Saturday morning. It's only a couple blocks long, but many Cubans have gotten used to this space, these few blocks of visibility. They come to expect it. They look forward to it. They consider it a step forward. And in 2019, when the LGBTQ community was still hurting from having the Article 68 removed from the Constitution, the Ministry of Health canceled the conga. Someone posted on Facebook that community and allies should march anyways, and it went viral. And that Saturday, hundreds of people gathered in Havana Central Park for a celebratory walk 
down the Paseo del Prado in the direction of the Malecon. And when they came to the end of the road, they were met by officials who asked them to disperse. And most people went their separate ways. They joined other activities that were planned for later in the day by Sunny Sex that hadn't been canceled. Um, but a small group of recognized dissidents were insisted on continuing and they were dragged away by plainclothes officers making headlines abroad. Now Trump, can, the restrictions from Trump continued to bear down. Uh, shipments of oil were being stopped from Venezuela. Cruise ships stopped coming to Cuba. The Escanal in September was forced to try to explain the severe shortages um, and, and promised that this was only going to be a difficult coyuntura, a temporary situation, and not the beginning of a new special period. Um, but in October, Trump limited remittances again and suspended flights to every international airport in Cuba except Havana right before the holidays, making it difficult for Cubans in the U.S. to come home. Tourism and travel were already suffering with only 4 million visitors by the end of the year compared to the 5 million that had been predicted. So painted in broad strokes, this was the situation in Cuba right before the pandemic. And of course things didn't get better. It's easy today to feel actually a little nostalgic about the early days of the pandemic um, because despite the difficulties of the year before, there was optimism. I mean, we were on an island, right? Um, and one with a strong public health infrastructure. And in moments like that, Cuba centralization felt like an advantage. Plans were, plans were made every day. Medical students knocked on your door to make sure no one had a fever and homeopathic remedies were given out to boost our immune system. Schools closed, paid parental leave began. Many of us worked from home. We started our mornings with the update from Dr. Duran. Cuba's head epidemiologist, a grand grandfather figure who became a member of the family, like the TV meteorologist, uh, Jose Rubiera. On social media, someone suggested we go out on our balconies to clap at 9 p.m. to give thanks, um, and we did it. We tried to stay home and stay safe. The city was paralyzed. The measures required sacrifices, but the new level of infection stayed low, and the state declared victory. But it wasn't over. <laughs> As the pandemic continued, every day was consumed by finding food. CU store, CUC stores went virtual, and then the platforms collapsed under the demand. Finding food online was almost as hard as finding it in person. And shopping in person meant arriving before dawn to enter a store, possibly by the mid-afternoon, often to find that the products you needed had run out. And social distancing was difficult to enforce while you were fighting to not lose your spot in line. Sometimes you could only shop at stores in your municipality, which made it difficult for people in neighborhoods with, with few hard currency stores. Um, and, but these were the problems that people had, the, the people that had money had, right? Um, people without hard currency had to wait for things to be resold in the black market um, in Cuban pesos at even higher prices. Uh, new WhatsApp businesses started to sell basic products, um, and in many households, the adults started to eat just one meal a day. And the good stuff was saved for the kids and for the grandparents. Over the summer, beaches and parks closed, and for months on end, we were stuck at home with a 9 p.m. curfew. Children weren't allowed in public places or their parents would be fined. Taking a jog or exercising in public places was banned. The malecon was closed. Um, but for other people, life went on as normal, and thanks to a Facebook Live by a young influencer, we learned what we were missing when she turned her mic over to her little sister and asked, what do you want to tell everybody in this Facebook Live? And she said, little girl says, you have to have a friend who's a colonel, so then you can go to the beach. Uh, but for the rest of the population who wasn't even able to sit on the malecon until late August of this year, or to visit the beach until just two weeks ago, um, being stuck at home <laughs> meant that the Cuban telenovela, the worst in years, <laughs> hit record viewership. So it was the year of the, of the MLAC, the, um, the currency reunification, and the end of the few subsidies that were still enjoyed by households. At first, the MLC stores only sold appliances, then luxury foods, but soon they were the only stores with anything on the shelves. Um, and the, the only way to load hard currency onto these cards from the United States 
was through AIS cards. And in September 2020, they were shut down by the US. The Western Union remittance office is closed in November, just in time for the US Thanksgiving. Um, and that November, flights to Havana were restored. Uh, Cuban Americans were eager to visit their families on the island, but it wasn't until January 1st that visitors were required to show a negative PCR uh, test in order to enter. December brought the news that after close to a decade of being told that currency reunification would only occur when the economy was strong enough to support it, now in the middle of the crisis, January 1st was announced as day zero. We were going to have two, six months to turn in our kook for Cuban pesos at the official rate. Minimum wage was increased from 400 to 2,000 pesos, but also bus fares and electricity rates and the cost of the goods on the libreta went up. 780% for the libreta. Subsidies were even removed for the subsidized canteens for vulnerable families. So predictably, after the short open opening to international travelers, the COVID cases began to climb again and shot from double digits of daily cases to hundreds to over 800 a day by February. And a new curfew, 7 p.m. was announced. The song Patria and Vida was released the same month, supporting the San Isidro movement that had made headlines in November. One neighbor complained, they keep announcing things they, and then they change their minds. First, the electricity rates go up, but then people complain and they make changes, but it didn't feel like we were being heard. It just felt like they hadn't thought things through and they didn't know what they were doing. There's an ethos in Cuba that supports resiliency. Uh, we say in Cuba, el cubano se ríe hasta de su propia gracia. We even laugh at, at the horrible things, right? Um, and one of the many ways that growing access to internet has affected social life in Cuba has been to give Cubans new ways to do that through creating memes and WhatsApp stickers in which critique becomes a different, uh, important part of everyday life. So that's what's new in Cuba. There's a perception that the state has ceded power to fundamentalist sects, and that's brought about a crisis of legitimacy among progressive Cubans who identify with the revolution's historical commitment to social justice and who question why the right to dissent is only respected when religiously based. As new decrees are introducing, are being introduced to expand limits on freedom of expression to digital spaces and new technologies. And the increased reach of the internet and social media is creating new spaces of debate and activism that are trying to now control. Um, these groups are having real impacts on the real world as well in response to the 2019 tornado, in response to the crisis of COVID in 2020, um, in Matanzas, 2021. Um, but there's a growing sense of awareness of collective efficacy that has come out of this. And the impacts of domestic economic policies on households have been severe. Um, and during the pandemic, the policies that were implemented in order to control the spread of COVID have required a great commitment and sacrifice from the population. And pandemic fatigue has set in. While people understood the economic need driving the decision to open the borders in late 2020, many criticized the lack of strict health requirements for visitors. And the state media shifted to blaming increased infections on irresponsible actions. Um, people stopped clapping at 9 p.m. The COVID infection rates continued to rise. And in June, the situation was out of control in Matanzas. And the last couple of months, Cuba's rushed to vaccinate the population after an unexplained delay. Um, and we now have heard the announcement that tourism will open up in November. I want to end with a story um, of an afternoon talking to a friend who's a part of this generation that stayed. Uh, a computer programmer, she works in Havana on contracts with foreign clients. She's the mother of two and she tells me, we're the generation that was born into the special period. I was just a little older than my kids are now when everything changed. My parents faced the abyss and now here I am with two kids looking at the next special period. They tried so hard to shelter me, and I used to wonder what it was like for them, but now I know. So when airports open again on November 15th, I think that I predict that many of those who stayed will leave. <laughs>
Many of the people I talked to haven't done so yet, not out of a desire to stay in Cuba to take to the streets, but only because embassies are closed and it's impossible to do paperwork with the city shut down. Flights to the US and many close places in the world are just not available. The few people I know who have traveled to the US have done so by flying through Europe, which is only an option for those with dual residencies or visas. Since late May, US airlines are only making reservations for the end of October. Um, and in the summer, the earliest tickets available were for the end of the year. I remember another conversation in Havana late last spring. After a year of searching for malanga and oatmeal, another mother with a baby and a toddler reflected on what the San Isidro movement had meant to her. And she told me, I remember that there was a protest about San Isidro and it felt so unimportant, like a performance. I didn't seem to feel, I didn't feel like that was my fight. I didn't care. I was worried about the MLC stores, about not getting sick and what I would do if they tried to separate me from my baby who was still nursing, if I got sick. I asked her, is there something that you would, that would make you go out into the streets? Like something that you care enough about to make that risk? And she thought about it and she told me, I would protest the MLC stores. I would protest that our kids are stuck indoors and not allowed to be in public places. I would protest the crazy prices, the removal of Article 68 from the Constitution, the way they celebrate the use of GMOs and the lack of support for small-scale local agriculture, the way they ignore the science and separate mothers and newborn babies for fear of COVID, the obstetric violence that's so normalized and the growing inequalities. I haven't talked to her since I left Havana on July 1st. I wonder if she ended up protesting after all. Thank you, Hope. We'll now move to Gabriel Vignoli from the New School University and who has spent many years doing research on the nature of socialism in Cuba. Gabriel. Thank you so much, uh, Meg, uh, for hosting this event. And of course, thank you so much, Hope, for a spectacular uh, contribution. I'm gonna try and pick up more or less from where Hope has left off. Uh, only I'm gonna take it in a different direction. I'm gonna look at words. And I'm gonna look at one specific event. I'm gonna start, of course, with the specific event of July 11th. And I'm going to try and frame it. And I'm also gonna try and go back to the, uh, uh, to the talk that Hope gave and try and make some connections in the sense that uh, going back to Hope's last vignette, it might be that July 11th uh, can be seen as a sort of breach of self-evident, as a crisis of intelligibility, which I believe allows for uh, a new possibility for rewriting kind of the political grammar of the Cuban nation. And it also entails somewhat of a revisitation of the past. To frame what I want to say, I just want to read one uh, brief quote by George Lemon, a Barbadian author uh, who talks about the post-colonial condition. In reality, he's talking about language. He's revisiting the Shakespearean Tempest. And he writes in 1960, Prospero has given Caliban language and with it an unstated history of consequences, an unknown history of future intentions. This gift of language meant not English in particular, but speech and concept as a way, a method, a necessary avenue towards areas of the self which could not be reached in any other way. In this way, it is this way, entirely prosperous enterprise, which makes Caliban aware of possibilities. Therefore, all of Caliban's future, for future is the very name of possibilities, must derive from prosperous experiment which is also his risk. Provided there is no extraordinary departure which explodes all of Prosper's premises, then Caliban and his future now belong to Prosper. Prosper lives in the absolute certainty that language, which is his gift to Caliban, is the very prison in which Caliban's achievements will be realized and restricted. Which means that this quote can be interpreted in different ways. 
obviously it can be interpreted as uh, in the David Goliath science, the sense of the Cuban government's fighting against the US empire, but also of the protesters fighting against the Cuban government. What that uh, indexes to me is first off, is that the July 11th protests allowed for a resignification of the special period. The special period mar marked a watershed in the nation's collective memory displacing 1959 as a historical reference point for the majority of the Cuban population. Today, when the Cuban government is hearkening back to 1959, either one to, are they claiming that the US wants to quote unquote restore a pre-1959 Cuba, or that 1959 was the fulfillment of frustrated self-determination going back from 1868 to 1898, my contention is that it no longer resonates with an increasingly growing demographic that places 1990 as the new year zero of the revolution. In other words, there's a well-known joke about the special period. We all went in it together, but we all came out one by one. In other words, in the words of uh, Guanchu, people ended up fighting their own routes out of the crisis. The problem is that in Cuba, that goes against one of the central periods of 1959, the revolutionary promise of equality. And this promise of equality is what has been at the core, probably, of the July 11th protests. This, as Hope was mentioning, have been uh, brought to the fore by the structural inefficiencies, not only produced by the uh, US embargo, but uh, by the promise of reform that spans back between 2011 the lineamientos and the 2021 tarea ordenamiento, which has resulted in the midst of a pandemic, uh, I contend in the reduced ability of the state to occupy its redistributive function and sort of a reduction of socialism to welfareism. If redistribution as a way to articulate the revolutionary nation into being today is worn and hollowed out, these changes are crucial for the future for the other revolution. People want food, electricity, enough money to have a decent living. They want to have a normal life. It is no longer the exceptionalism of the Cuban revolution, but normalcy of daily life that is at stake and is increasingly relevant for the Cuban population. This is because what the Zarea Ordenamiento has highlighted is the increasing inequality and increased precarization of daily life. In particular, when the COVID-19, uh, sorry, when the events of July 11th and 12th took place, where thousands of Cubans protested in tens of cities from San Antonio de los Baños to Palma Soriano, the event in and of itself transformed the way in which the government looked at its population. Uh, in the words of uh, a woman that was televised in global media, nos quitamos el ropaje del silencio. We took off the clothing of silence. But Albert Hirschman uh, calls voice as opposite to exit, right? There is no longer a possibility, as Hope was hinting at, of exiting or voting with our feet for the Cuban population today. That may change as of November 15th, but the only avenue left is the avenue of voice, of protest. The exact numbers, as well as the precise origin of the protests, have become tools in the stratification of competing articulation of these events. Based on how one reads the protests, one produces different solutions. Who protested? The Cuban people, Afro-Cubans, dissidents, confused revolutionaries, regime change Washington funded organizations aided by booths and retweets. Either protests are seen as a soft coup they're not seen as being organic to Cuban society, but as being heterodirected from the US and thus easily dismissed. Analysis therefore must not be synoptic, otherwise it risks silencing the complexity to a few common denominators. As we all know today, in the early afternoon of July 11th, Diaz Canel uh, went on a stroll in San Antonio de los Baños, echoing Fidel Castro's experience in La Habana streets in, on the famous Malaconazo of 1994. Uh, then 
Later on in the same day, he gave a televised speech in which we uh, framed the events through the lens of counter-revolutionary and humanitarian intervention uh, actions as tools of regime change. By closing the speech with, a, with the quote, the streets belong to the revolutionary, the order for combat has been given, the revolutionaries must go to the streets. The escalates both rehearsed the state of siege articulation of the revolution and gave in the eyes of many a clear mandate to covert and overt violence. The response of the White House was, to say the least, of course, underwhelming in silencing the agency that the US embargo has in producing uh, inequality and uh, shortages in Cuba. What I want to highlight is that both Diaz-Canel and Biden seemed desperate in a way to bring back the protest into the fold of the Cold War with this reliable friend enemy dialect that enabled that state of siege. You are either against or for the revolution. You are either against or for democracy. But the Cold War is over and the reality on the ground demands a new interpretive lens. By reducing protests to violence, the, both the Cuban government indexing an, an attack on high currency stores and as, as an attack on the social fabric of the revolution, and the US indexing violence as a cry for freedom and a loss of fear. What was silenced was that many protests were indeed peaceful, yet it did not matter as they were silenced in the global media hype. And it is to these silences that we must attune our analysis. The silences that erase social transformation marred by growing poverty and inequality. Both governments focused on a binary oppositional discourse to define popular identity that does not capture anymore its heterogeneity as much as it artificially re reduces it to a pre-established set of polar opposites. Revolutionaries, counter-revolutionaries, free oppressed. The problem is that binarism has become the framework of intelligibility of the political, and that this reductionism is beginning to misfire as it produces irreconcilable political identities that hint ultimately to the demise of the political. The embracement of conspiracy theories, the invisibilization of actors that don't fall within the binary French enemy dialectic. And there are many structural challenges that are left unaddressed with this stance. Within Cuba, and these are data given by Cuban scholars, the PCC is unable today to mediate between the government and the people as 14% of voters are PCC members, but 95% of the National Assembly is comprised of PCC members. 35% um, of Cuban youth have not known the special period or have only known Cuba after the special period. 4.4 million Cubans are connected to the web, which makes the web uh, an impossible enemy for the Cubans government to fight against. Misinformation or disinformation, in other words, is bound to grow. And Cubans are likely to increase their distrust in a government that no longer acts as a quote unquote provider of last resort and has difficult, visible difficulties in renewing its political language. There is little control of Facebook and no control of WhatsApp and Telegram, which are increasing dramatically during the pandemic. That of course goes to show in the July 11th uh, events Right, we know that the SOS Cuba and SOS Montanza's Twitter feeds tied to humanitarian intervention exploded on July 11th and July 12th, 2021. The response of the Cuban government provided by Bruno Rodriguez on July 12th was not sufficient. You cannot fight disinformation by claiming that SOS Cuba was launched by a Florida-based company called Proactivo Miami with funds from the Florida State Department. It is not enough. The Cuban people want or are not looking for a different language. Social media allowed in a way for the protests to spread quickly with a speed that felt like challenging the inertia of governmental regulations and COVID-19 mandated lockdowns. 
The clearest example has to do with the origin of the protests, whether it's spontaneous and leaderless or whether organized from outside and fueled by social media. We don't have yet a definitive answer to the question, but we do know that they change the geopolitics of US-Cuba relations. In the US, 11, uh, 11J or 11J, the 11th of July, brought Cuba back to the US politics stop spotlight, but it was short-lived. Afterwards, Afghanistan happened and Cuba returned to the back burner. Protests make a de-escalation on the US less likely. For Cuba, Biden remains a domestic policy issue and he lost in Florida. Biden is leaving his Cuba policy in the hands of the most conservative Cuban American diaspora, de facto following Trump's example. Trump's outsourced his policy to Marco Rubio. Biden is doing the same with Bob Menendez. And by doing so, he reduces the Cuban American community to its more conservative part. In other words, the Biden administration is not under much pressure to do anything. They might be waiting for the probably enemy to pass on the river, the body of the enemy to pass on the flowing river. What I hope is that the Cuban diaspora in the US may be in a more self-questioning mode and asking themselves, what is more relevant to me? My anti-Castroism or my family's well-being based on the violence that happened on those two days. Going back to the Obama style normalization does not seem like a viable option in the present. A new dialogue between the two countries is necessary, but if and when it will happen, it will be a different premises. On the Cuban side, the great benefit of July 11th was the multilateralization of Cuba-US divide, marked by several countries sending aid to Cuba and overtly criticizing the embargo. And that is what the Cuban government should strive to maintain this multilateralization of conflict. The opportunity is of de-bureaucratizing and transforming the economic structure of the country, and we'll get to that later. And then, of course, we have the global geopolitics after Corona and other actors, China, Russia, the European Union, that need to be involved into the picture. The key result of the protests, in, in tangible terms, the most immediate result of the protests was that the Cuban government declared two days after the protests, the temporary elimination of individual imports limitations of food and medicines. The first measure taken by the government, in other words, was an administrative measure that could have been taken a long time before July 11th. What that signals is, in my understanding, the challenge that the Cuban government still faces to implement political and economic reforms rather than administrative one. And here we go to what July 11th did, which is probably a breach in the discursive monopoly of the Cuban government. That is in, uh, signified, as Hope was mentioning, in the shift from the so-called historic generation to a new political nomenclature through the language of continuity, but in the absence in the conditions of possibility for continuity to be exerted, as in a way history itself in Cuba has lost its charisma. Fidel Castro had a lot of history behind him. He brought with him the solution to the ills of Batista and a Cuba subservient to the US. His legacy was also the pacification of Cuba, which had been in conflict between 1868 and 1965. Fidel brought stability, but the price was homogeneity. The Ascanel, in the eyes of political discourse, is guilty of the greatest sin that revolutionary power can have. He has no history. Paraphrasing Kantorovich's bodies of the king, he then had four bodies in one, the state, the party, the military, the people, and history itself. The Escanel cannot embody, quote unquote, the nation as he did. He needs to find another language. He must strive for constructive dissent rather than homogeneity. While Fidel and Raul had the legitimacy of history, Diaz Canel and anyone who may follow after him can only find legitimacy through their performance in office 
People want solutions, not words. And words don't carry the same weight as they did before. The challenge that I contend we should engage with is, and that is my suggestion for uh, the audience, is to look for a new political grammar. With the protests, the Cuban government ceased to have lost two crucial monopolies, the monopoly on violence and the monopoly of language or discourse. In order for political discourse to function in Cuba, I believe it must be embraced by the very heterogeneous nation that took to the streets in July. And it must be proactive, not reactive, or else, as Hope was hinting at, patria muerte risks being framed through the lens of patria vida. It is impossible to go back to normalcy as the causes of the protests have no short term solution. And the experience of protest will itself continue to percolate. And I hear a quote Eileen Torres Santana at home, in neighborhoods, online, on the sidewalks, and in the body. If the government resorts to all dogmas, it will, be, it will effectively blow up bridges and make the political rage of at least a sector of the population unintelligible. More than ever, the question of what is good and just for Cuba is an open question. And now more than ever, the answers cannot be captured in a, sing in a single still photo or tone of voice. Protests and dissent, in other words, are part of the political. They're not to be repressed, but listened to, both in Cuba and in the US. In other words, the 11 July protests are not a singular event, but rather the expression of an ongoing political, economic, and social process that will lead to new protests if it is not understood and engaged with. And it signals the imperative to find a new way to articulate the political. The Cold War rhetoric ought to be transcended in both countries. Paraphrasing Raymond Williams, what I want to focus on here is our today are a set of keywords. The Cuban Revolution has a very strong repertoire of words that it uses to define the political. And I contend that some of them are outdated, some of them need resignification, and some of them uh, are coming into the fore. The outdated ones would be, first off, binarism. The binary reading of Cuba produces an artificially homogenous Cuban society, and it is a disservice to the Cuban people and to the complexity of this situation. This binary reading has been embraced by the Cuban government, state of siege equals homogeneity, difference equals dissidence, and by the US government. Communism equals oppression, capitalism equals freedom. And it is a product of the Cold War, but the Cold War is over and it no longer holds as a policymaking framework, despite the fact that Biden still sees Cuba through the lens of the Cold War, sadly. The other hollowed out keyword I contend is paradoxically the word embargo. I believe that what Cuba should do is to forget the blockade. It is there to stay. The focus ought to be on what Cuba can do, not on what the US may or may not do. The corollary question, therefore, is not what the embargo is, but what does it allow for? What purposes does it serve? In Cuba, many argue that it, is, that it allows for regime consolidation rather than regime change, as it is easily and rightly blamed for Cuba's ills. Reforms in Cuba must not and cannot depend on the embargo. The embargo is there since 1962. Well, if you go back to the Mallory Memorandum since 1960. In the US, it is about a domestic policy issue at face value. La Habana, Miami is more important than La Habana in the presidential elections. But more profoundly, it is about the same malaise that the Cuban government is suffering from, the inability to resignify its own political grammar. The ideals of freedom, democracy, and human rights sound hollow to the people of the global south, even more when proclaimed through the stick of the embargo. Latin America in particular has long taken note. It is almost redundant to state that the US embargo in Cuba dramatically undermines human rights in Cuba, 
and as a corollary that humanitarian, humanitarian intervention as a tool of regime change is a blatant hypocrisy and should be denounced for what it is. Sadly, the other key words that might be, might have become hollowed out between the special period and today are words like equality, resistance, sacrifice, and survival. The key words that I contend are in need of resignification and are or in question are the words people, where Cubans are much more diverse than portrayed by either government, revolution, which has become a question mark, socialism, what does a Cuban way to a 21st century socialism look like? Nation, immigration, and political discourse. The new key words that are open to signification are constitution. The effects of the 11 July protests may lead to the use of the 2019 constitution as a tool of legitimation of a pluralization of political spaces. A clear example is a demonstration called forth by the Grupo Archipelago in Cuba in November 2021. The government responded by hearkening back again to the stage of siege jargon by declaring November 20th as the National Defense Day. The group's response was to move the march back to November 15th, the first day in which Cuba opens up its frontiers to international travel. Today itself, on October 12th, the Cuban authorities have denied the protest, stating that, quote, while a constitutional right is invoked, this right cannot be exercised against the other rights, guarantees, and essential tenets of the Constitution. Reading the, the manifestation through the lens of regime change. While at this stage, it is unclear whether there are US funding sources behind the group, what matters is that what is unclear is what will happen in November. And what is clear is that it will be a test ground for the future. Other words such as disinformation, fear, several, several friends I spoke to while in La Habana after the July 11 protests told me, se perdió el miedo. And freedom are acquiring maybe different meanings, different words. Inertia, which is one of the main forces of history, needs to be escaped and transformed. Another fundamental word is the word money. Today, more than the US government, it is the US dollar that is the highest risk factor for the Cuban revolution. Through hyperinflation, money has become Dahida's pharmacon, remedy, poison, and scapegoat, and scapegoat. By demonizing money with the new money in 1965, with the revolutionary offensive in 1968, with dollarization in 1993, and currently, the government has turned both into the nemesis of the revolution and an agent of contamination that is beyond control and today fragments economic landscape in multiple ways. We all remember the seven exchange rates that the CUC had, making the Cuban economy ultimately illegible to the state's own gaze and challenging economic stability. Money, including the MLSA, which uh, many economists, including Pavel Vidal, say it's not actual money, does not hold the ascribed functions of money, unit of account, store of value, and means of exchange. It distorts supply and demand, it renders inequality more visible, and it challenges state authority at the core through hyperinflation. And the last word I want to leave you with is probably the word future. The past is no longer the reference point. Humans have moved from historical exhaustion, as Padura used to say, to the exhaustion of history itself as a meaning-making device. Their interest is in the future, and the government must follow suit. It remains unable, if it remains unable to articulate a new political grammar, it will find itself supplanted, but not by internal insurrection or external intervention, but by monetary implosion and the memeification of critique. Memes are today uh, a ubiquitous mode of social critique. So questions for the audience would be, what do you think are the essential keywords for the articulation of Cuba's political grammar in the near future? What other challenges do you see? And there are many, 
one could look at the experiment in modern monetary theory and the way with the Biden administration, which is leading to increased inflation in the US. And it may have a substantive impact on the dollarization process in the Cuban economy. There are also, of course, potential opportunities, such as Cuba being one of the first countries in the world to reach herd immunity. But all in all, what I contend is that the protests of July 11 have uh, created the condition of possibility for a re-signification of the political present and the future of the Cuban nation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gabriel. Um, we will now move to questions and answers. Uh, those of you in the audience who would like to ask a question please put it into the Q&A room rather than the chat room. And we will begin with a question from Philip Brenner of American University, uh, who begins by saying, Hope, excellent presentation. And he asks, the US press has described the tension in Cuba as a conflict between government supporters and freedom seeking protesters. You described a more complex reality where there is a large group of Cubans who support socialism and are angry about the government's seeming lack of commitment to the revolution's values. Could you say more about these Cubans? Does La Tisa reflect their views? Hope. Okay, yeah, so thanks for the question. Um, obviously, I think from both of both of our uh, talks tonight, one common theme is how extremely complex the reality is, right? It's not something that can be summarized with neither with the, the patria muerte or patria in libertad, right? These binaries are very harmful because they hide the reality, right? Um, and the, you talk about Latisa. Latisa is a, a digital magazine um, that they say that they aspire to become a platform uh, for for critical thought uh, to debate the project of the Cuban Revolution um, and in relation to um, the political practices of the of the current and what's needed for the future. Right. So it's definitely a generation of young people, young intellectuals who are a part of this group that I mentioned, the group that has decided to stay, right? Um, the group that is trying to, uh, to look for a future in, the, in this project of a country that's coming from a perspective, um, the TISA, that definitely defends socialism. You know, they, they draw on Marx, they draw on other Marxist uh, authors who are actually not very well known in Cuba. Um, and they have a discourse that's very, um, that's very attractive to young people, right? Um, they're doing a much better job communicating than the state is doing. Um, and, and often um, their, their positions support the state, um, but are much uh, more eloquent, right? Um, there, there's a group of people, of young people, the ones who have decided to stay, um, who are kind of trying to hold the state accountable for the lack of continuity not in the structures of power or who's in, in control, um, but in the, the continuity of commitment to social justice um, transformations into this idea of revolution, revolution right? Um, so they're working, they're working hard to promote um, the new family code, the families code. Um, and they're, they're a group of, um, that has very clear the problems of inequalities um, they have a transversal kind of approach to inequalities. They know that rights are being denied to the LGBT community. They know um, the inequalities, the racial inequalities, and the economic inequalities that have become a part of, of everyday reality in Cuba. And they're not afraid to, um, to criticize the state because of those things. Um, and there's other there's other new um, magazines like the Manigua, Cimarronas, uh, the Joven Cuba is another kind of from the left, the socialist left. It's crit 
part of these critiques. Um, Comunistas is another, um, which obviously comes from a communist background, right? Um, but they're all bringing up the question of inequalities um, and, and what's going on in Cuban society and making it much more complex, letting us see the complexity that's there. Thank you, Hope. Mm -hmm. um, this is something that you can answer too. Uh, it's a very brief question. Um, if one has hard currency, what is the impact of inflation, assuming you can find what you are seeking in the stores? <laughs> yeah, so the first part, the last part is the first part, right? Assuming that you can find what you're seeking. Um, and over in recent years, the amount of stuff that has come into Cuba through uh, mule chains, through people's suitcases traveling abroad is, is extremely significant, right? And that's something that's been cut off since last March, right? So just the amount of, of what can be bought, what's available. Um, and the other question is, when um, you have to talk about what hard currency are we talking about, right? Um, because when we talked about hard currency up until last December, we were talking about CUCs, right? Um, but hard currency is just um, currency that can be, well, it's actually currency that can be um, exchanged on the international market, which the CUC can't be, right? Um, but if we talk about hard currency now, what's the most important hard currency in Cuba? Um, it depends on what you want, what you need and what you, what you want to do with it, right? Because there's the MLC, um, which are in the bank and can only be spent um, with, with cards electronically. So you can only use it really in uh, stores, but you can also transfer it now electronically from account to account, right? Um, and there's the US dollar, right? But now you can't deposit the US dollar in the banks anymore um, since, since June. Uh, there were temporary, that was temporarily um, see, like there's a temporary suspension of being able to deposit dollars. So the euro became the new, um, you know, the new value store on the, in the informal market, right? So there's a lot, um, there's a lot of different hard currencies actually circulating in the market right now. And it depends what you need to buy or what you're trying to get with them, which of those uh, currencies make the most sense. So I hope that helps. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Hope. Yeah. Uh, a question for Gabriel Vignoli from Dr. Edgar Go. What are the facts for you to say the Cold War is over? I agree that the Cuban system and policies has problems and makes mistakes, but can you really ignore the constant and increased sanctions and subversion focused on the younger generation? Diaz Canal and company have agreed that the protesters on July 11th had their point, but the aggression and violence was escalated by the US and their fans like MSA. I have the feeling that you are blaming the victim instead changing the context. That is the US aggressions. The blockade is an attack against Cubans. The U.S. aggressions, the blockade, and others are undercutting reforms in Cuba. Where are reforms in the U.S. and many other countries in Latin America? Gabriel? So when I tell my students uh, what Cuba might mean for them, my U.S. students, I always tell them that going to Cuba will make them better citizens of their own country. Because it is in, 19, in 1898 that the US owns its own political grammar, its own imperial political grammar. It is there, uh, Lou Paris might be the person to cite most widely, that keywords such as freedom and democracy take place in a given context. For sure, I, I hope it didn't come across in my talk that I'm silencing US responsibility. As I mentioned, uh, freedom and democracy are words that have lost their value in the eyes of the global South when uttered in the US. 
The challenge for me is that this binary stance, which is the legacy of the Cold War, the friend enemy dialectic does not help the Cuban government nor the Cuban people in terms of creating a more functioning society. Obviously, one of the many root, it's not that the, that the embargo is the root cause of all evils. The embargo is a structuring device for the revolution as a state of siege that percolates since the beginning of the 60s. The challenge for the Cuban authorities, in my view, is to, of course, denounce and acknowledge the embargo, but not to focus excessively on it. It's like telling uh, a person that has polio, oh, I am so sorry, you have polio, and reducing the entire social body to that disease without looking at the potentialities that the social body has. Of course, the embargo is highly limiting, but it's there to stay. And the Cuban government has no authority over lifting the embargo. So the focus should not be beyond what has already been achieved. Cuba denounces the embargo every year and it wins overwhelmingly at the United Nations, but it cannot and should not be on the embargo. The embargo is there to stay. What Cuba has to look at, what the Cuban government has to look at is what can we do as a country to create a better future for ourselves. Thank you, Gabriel. Here is another question for you. On your proposition of an alternative political grammar, could you spe speculate on whether there is, possibly will be in the future, the emergence of new imaginaries? in the sense that Castonadis deploys the idea of an imaginary. I appreciate this is not a question based on your presentation, but he hopes that you will be able to respond to it in relation to Cuba. I think there's, uh, I guess you're talking about Castoriadis' imagination. I think there's two ways yes. to, to look at it. One is, as Hope was just mentioning, uh, there is an increasing media sphere in Cuba uh, where, above all, the youth that want to stay are taking the discourse into their own hands. And that might be the fun, a, a crucial space, a crucial platform for articulation of uh, a political discourse that does not fall in the friend binary uh, or Cold War binarism. Of course, they have to be very, very wary of not uh, being associated to US funding sources. But the one that I think is maybe even most relevant is a source of uh, Cuban ethos, which comes, uh, it's been worded by a Cuban designer called Ernesto Orosa, which uh, he calls the, arc, uh, sorry, the idea of technological disobedience. So one of the byproducts of scarcity is that Cubans have been uh, trained or have achieved the ability to disrespect the preconceived authority that objects have on us. Bruno Latour used to say that when, te when technology breaks apart, it speaks to us. To a Cuban, that would be laughable. Cubans are, in the words of Orosa, like numerous like surgeons that break machinery apart to order in order to resignify it. And of course, the leap from the ability to disrespect the preconceived authority of objects is also the ability to disrespect the preconceived authority of political discourse and to resignify it in your own terms. So I think that ethos of uh, technological disobedience uh, is the one that allows people to look, for example, at the city of La Habana, not as something suspended between a ruin and a museum, but as spaces that can be inhabited and redesigned, re-signified, reconceived. You're all, all of you who have been to Cuba, have, uh, to La Habana, have seen the barbacoas, 
the, inter the multiple intervention in the physical structure of the city. Those appear to be uh, a sort of negative intervention, but it's an intervention that allows at least temporarily for improved quality of life. So I would say those would be the, the spaces for, for the production of an alternative imaginary. Thank you. Um, we have a question now from the Dominican historian Antonio Mendez, who says he never likes to question the motives of people who struggle and protest for change. However, can you both speak of the differences and commonalities of motives of people protesting for change in Cuba as well as in the United States? Hope, do you want to start? Yeah, yeah, it's a really, really interesting question. Um, and I don't think I have an answer yet. <laughs> um, <laughs> but but I want to think I want to keep thinking about this. Um, but one of the first things that comes into my mind um, are the protests. I mean, I was in Cuba um, watching the protests in the summer of 2020 in the United States around um, around racial justice and Black Lives Matter and, and, and um, police brutality. Um, and it was in a moment in which the risks of, of going into the street with COVID were people felt were so high, but the need to protest was even higher, right? Um, and so it makes me like, it makes me think about this parallel also in terms of like the context of COVID internationally and what our lives are like in different places um, as we try to stay inside, as we try to shelter in place as some people aren't able to do that. Um, and and what, what street protests mean in this moment internationally um, with COVID, right? So I think the first thing I thought of was kind of uh, the, the protests in the United States um, and the protests in Cuba and, and what um, they have in common, right? Um, and I think one of them is, is, you know, after being stuck inside forever, um, having lots to express and lots um, that, that you need to have um, take take out. Um, and, and just, yeah, the commonality I think is, is they're not new problems that people were responding to. Um, they were just um, even, even um, more acutely felt, right? Um, and people were willing to take the risk, so. I look forward to thinking more about that question. Gabriel? I'll be, I'll be very brief as well. I really like uh, Hope's uh, connection of risk and need. Uh, my feeling is that there is, since before the pandemic, which of course operates as an accelerator of ongoing political processes, a crisis of the state and a crisis of citizenship, which has obviously broadly resulted in increasing populism. and. In a way, the question is, both in Cuba and in the US, what does it mean to be an American and what does it mean to be a Cuban, right? In a, uh, under Trump, uh, the, the metaphor of the wall, whether the wall was constructed or not, it becomes partially irrelevant, resulted uh, in a dehyphenation of America's identity. American became progressively more male, straight, and white. The hyphenated identities were metaphorically erased. In Cuba, with the rehearsal of the pandemic, which entailed uh, a rehearsal of the state of siege, not in discursive terms, but in experiential terms, what came about was also the exhaustion, I believe, of, those, of some of those keywords, like resistance, sacrifice, survival, People don't want to hear those words anymore. They're tired of those. They've been imposed so long that now they want to dance, party, and, and have the illusion of a normal life. The key word has become normalcy. And I think that is one of the challenges that links both countries together. There is a crisis in the articulation of the political grammar of citizenship in both countries. And it seems to be that both leaders are, as of today, unable to articulate it in, uh, in both countries. 
or at least need some help in doing that. Thank you, Gabriel. We have a question from John McAuliffe, a long-term Cuba advocate, who states that the key question is how can we move the Biden administration to finally restore remittances and travel this month, and whether that could affect how the Cuban government handles the protest on November 15th. Why don't we begin with hope? I think it's a wonderful question for us to ask ourselves um, from where we're sitting in the United States. Um, and yeah, I mean, the if, if remittances or travel um, were restored in any significant way, it would have a huge huge impact in the, in the hopelessness on the, um, yeah, the, the drive people to protest and to drive them to the streets. Um, and, and Biden hasn't done anything uh, significantly to change the situation that was created um, during the Trump administration. I think Gabriel? for me, it's, I don't want to hammer always the same point, but the keywords that shape the political grammar are most powerful when they're uh, invisible, when they're naturalized, rather. Biden is a man that, uh, he was 21 when the missile crisis happened. He's a man that came of age in the Cold War. The interpretation of Cuba for Biden is performed through a lens of the Cold War, through a lens of human rights as civic rights silencing so-called second and third generation human rights, social and economic rights. Obama could make that move because he was just born when the missile crisis happened and his interpretation of the event or his interpretation of the Cuban revolution probably is through a decolonial or post-colonial lens. That is the challenge that we're facing today. I don't think Biden is, uh, conceptually interested, not, not that he's unable intellectually, of course, but the concepts that have shaped his own political life go counter to what the revolution embodies. So I, I, I don't think that's gonna be a priority throughout his tenure. And I'm afraid uh, that he's not gonna make any structural moves also because as we know, Bob Menendez holds the balance of power in the Senate. Thank you. Um, if there don't appear to be any additional questions, um, so I shall move to the most important, one of the most important elements of these webinars, and that is a warm thank you to Gretchen Sanchez and Ellen, oops, Ellen Johnson, who have kept us technically on our feet etc. And I want to remind people that on October 26th, we will discuss the current crises, plural, in Peru with Joe Marie Burt uh, from George Mason University, Cynthia McClintock from George Washington University, and Martha Pro, who is the director of the Center for Rural and Urban Development in Lima, Peru. Um, I want to compliment both Hope and Gabriel on superb presentations. Hope you presented a extraordinarily warm and insightful description of humanity in Cuba today. Uh, it was a very warm and uh, thoughtful presentation. And then we had Gabriel, who is the theoretician of complexity with respect to Cuba. So they both uh, deserve a very warm welcome. Uh, no, thank you. We've already done the welcomes. And I want to thank also the audience uh, that joined us tonight, and we look forward to seeing you again.
on October 26th and November 4th when we launch our book with strong recommendations to the Biden administration about revitalizing the memorandums of understanding signed between 2015 and 2017 concerning U.S.-Cuban cooperation on environmental issues. So tonight, and we look forward to seeing you all again. And thanks again to Gabriel and Hope. Excellent presentations.